right, if you've got your Bibles, you can turn to Acts chapter number 8. Acts chapter 8 in your Bibles. My mind's just flooding with all kinds of thoughts of something to preach. I got the slide up there that says guest preacher, Eric Knight, and uh, I hope he shows up. All right, if you turn into Acts chapter number 8, <clears throat> I'm going to first start in Proverbs uh, 24 and read a verse and uh, just trusting maybe this is where the Lord will have us to go tonight, just kind of talk through something, maybe help you with something. In Proverbs 24 and verse number 10, the Bible says this, If thou faint in the day of adversity, thy strength is small. Uh, if you quit when you hit adversity, then something's wrong with your strength and you haven't been prepared um, for the day of battle. I mean, if you realize that you can't plan out when the day of adversity is going to be, going to be coming, um, you might feel like, well, I, I don't have any adversity right now. And you may walk out the door and something may happen. Um, today, after we left church, we got outside and uh, Brother Maxie's truck had a flat tire. You never know when issues are going to arise in your life, when problems are going to arise and when you're going to have difficulties in your life. And so what you always have to be is strong all the time so that when the difficulty comes, you are ready to face the difficulty. And uh, so I'm going to preach a message to you uh, tonight, Lord willing, on this thought, why does adversity come in my life? Why do I have, why do we face difficulties in our life? And we've said several things about this in the past with different uh, some of the podcasts and things like that. And this may be a little different view of it than what we've talked about in the podcasts. Um, we've talked about living in a, a, a sinful world uh, in the podcast, and we've talked a little bit about that. But specifically, when it comes to why am I facing pressures in my life and issues in my life, why? Acts chapter number 8, somebody called me this morning and uh, was asking me, they were bouncing an idea off of me, uh, getting ready for their church service this morning, and they talked about specifically something that's going to refer to in Acts chapter number 8. Look at verse number 1. It says, And Saul was consenting unto his death, and at that time there was a great persecution against the church. So there's persecution happening um, against the church, which is at Jerusalem, and there were all scattered, uh, they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles, and devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church. He was doing things to the people uh, of the church. You may realize the church is not a building, it's the people. And so he's making havoc of all these people. He's having, he calls them problems, entering into every house. So not only is it where they're meeting at, but in every single house they're, in, they're part of. And hailing or hauling uh, men and women uh, committed them to prison. So he's taking them to prison. Uh, he's entering into houses. He's making havoc of the church. Uh, therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Now that's interesting there. Let me give you the first point and, um, of why you might be facing some kind of adversity. It may be pressure to get you out of your comfort zone. You may be there. The idea with them, the reason why they had pressure, the reason why God allowed pressure to come into their life, God had told them a long time ago to go into all the world and preach the gospel. God had been telling them for quite a while, go into all the world and preach the gospel. But they got to this area where they were at and they just kind of held up and they're not going anywhere. They're not spreading out. Maybe they're waiting for the right time. I don't know. But then God gives them some pressure, a little bit of some push just to get them ready so that they will step out and do something. And I think sometimes God will do that. God may do something in a church specifically to get you thinking more about reaching people outside these doors. Now, when COVID hit, um, I mean, everybody just went absolutely crazy. I'm, I'm writing a book and it'll come out and maybe 30 years from now, I'll probably get it out. But in that book, part of it talks about uh, politics and how a church will try to push a pastor one way or the other when it comes to politics, when it comes to stuff. And, and people were just, I mean, flat out uh, blown away by all the stuff that was going on with it. And if we tried to, if we tried to go one direction and tried to have mass, there was people that's like, ah, oh, you're being a Democrat. And if you didn't have mass, there was somebody over here saying, we're going to go get sick. And everybody was just pushing every direction. And let me tell you something, people were not exercising faith that I saw. People were living in panic and fear. And we had all kinds of stuff going on. And let me tell you something. I want you to get a hold of this. I think this is a very true statement. 
People were saying, how dare you tell me that I can't go out and talk to you? How dare you tell me that I can't get out of my house? How dare you tell me that I can't go and congregate at church? And then after all the restrictions came off, people are like, I don't really feel like going to church. I don't feel like going out and talking to anybody. When they tell you you can't do it, then you start feeling like, well, bless God, you can't tell me. I'm going to go talk to people. And then when you've got the opportunity to do it, well, there's more important things than coming to church or talking to people. And so sometimes I think, listen to this close, really close. I think sometimes God will allow some pressures to come in our life just to shake us up a little bit and show us exactly where we're at in our Christian life. Kind of show us where, where, how we're facing things and what we're doing. I told somebody this morning, they, they called me and they said, it's interesting to think about the fact that in every time that Jesus was working with people, um, he, was, he was having to deal with, with people, but there was always problems everywhere he went. And I said, well, I don't have the time to walk you through every bit of it, but I've got in my Bible the book of, the book of Mark. Uh, everything is, is, is color-coded throughout the book. I have that he is, he is ministering to multitudes. It's in blue. Everywhere he's ministering to the multitudes. He's feeding thousands. He's, he's speaking to these people. He's doing this over here. Uh, people are, are getting healed. He's ministering to multitudes. But the whole time he's ministering to multitudes, he's also molding men. He'll speak to crowds, and then he'll get his men off to the side, and he'll start talking about something, explaining things to them. And he was also managing menaces. And I told, you, I, I told him, I said, the issue is everywhere he went to try to do good, there was always somebody standing around saying, well, I wouldn't have done it that way, and I wouldn't have done it at that time, and I wouldn't in that place, and I went in on this day, there's always somebody to cause problems along the way. And he said, yeah, it's like that even in the church today. And I said, yes, it is. And when you look at Acts chapter 8, it's a great example of it. And the reason why God allowed things to happen in that church is because they had become kind of comfortable with sitting in Jerusalem and just thinking people will come to us. And God never intended the church to be some, God never intended for us to have church where we sit in here and we act like Christians in here and we never go out and tell anybody outside these doors. God never intended for the church to be that way. God never intended, listen to something else. God never intended for us to come in here, sit in our comfortable chairs, dress ourselves up, and talk about how wicked the world is, talk about how bad they are, and talk about how sorry they are, and then go out there and never tell one of those people about Jesus Christ. Sometimes I think the pressure comes to try to just shake us a little bit and show us that we need to get busy about telling other people about Jesus Christ. Uh, there may become a day that, that uh, they may do a lot like they did before. They say, you can't tell anybody, you can't do anything else. And that day we're going to have to uh, make our mind up whether we're going to do it or we're not going to do it. But I'm telling you right now, we've got the freedom and the liberty to tell everybody we meet about Jesus Christ and we just don't do it. I told him this morning, and I've said this several times to you, that when we used to go down to Galveston, we would, as soon as we'd get down there to go fishing, is the first thing we'd do is we'd get in a little flat bottom boat, we'd grab a, a little, uh, like four or five or six crab traps, we would find the stinkiest, rotten meat we could find, you'd open up the top, you'd put it right in the middle, you'd close it up, you'd take it out to the, uh, an area in the shallower waters, you'd throw it out in there, has a little, a little uh, a buoy attached to it, and you let it sit out there in the water. And that was one way of fishing. The way we would fish is we'd throw it out there and hope that the stink that was in the middle would draw the, the crabs in, and they would come in to eat that and could not get out of the trap. There was another way that we used to fish. And we would go out on the boat, we'd find out where we thought schools of fish were at, and then we'd grab our big net, and we'd take the casting net and throw it out. It would go over all the fish, you pull it in, and you grab in piles of fish with a throw net. Now, one's a very active way, and one's a very passive way, right? One way, you go out, and you spot where they're at, and you throw them out, and you go get them, and you bring them in. The other way, you throw a, 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 something out there with some stink in the middle of it. You go back and sit at your house and watch TV, and four or five hours later, you go back and see what you got in the, in the deal. One's a lazy man's way, and one's a working man's way, right? Well, sometimes in the church, that's the way we think. We think if we can just get something that the world wants right in the middle of this, of this auditorium, that the world will flood in the doors and they'll all come in here and we'll be happy because we've got more numbers, we've got more folks, and we'll get the world to come in. When God never intended for the church to be a trap to try to get people trapped into here, He intended for us to be a net and go out and reach people with the gospel. Amen. Now, we'll all say amen. The problem is, on Saturday morning, when it's time to go do it, a lot of people just don't do it. And so sometimes I think God may, even like this whole COVID thing, 
God may do something to the church to shake the church up a little bit to say to the church, what's really important to you? What's really important? <clears throat> Sometimes these persecutions can break us right out of our rut and our comfort zones and get us to see that there's something important out there, more important than us. That's the first one. Go back to Acts chapter number 5. I, I, you know, you're going to be praying this whole sermon. And where is Brother Freddie when you need him? Acts chapter number 5. One of them is pressure. Pressure to get you out of your comfort zone. <clears throat> the second one, Acts chapter 5 and verse number 1. Watch this. But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession and kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? Whilst it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. See, here these people are. They had an opportunity to do something good and right. And what they did with it is they did something. They did a, a portion of something, but they did it. This is the way I understand it. They did it with the spirit of, look at me, look at what I've done. They actually held back a big portion of it. They just did things to try to get people to see who they were and to praise them. And so they've kept back. And listen, it wasn't a matter of just lying to men. They were lying to God. In verse number 5, And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost, and great fear came upon all them that heard these sayings. And the young men arose, uh, arose, wound him up, and carried him out and buried him. And it was about the space of three hours after, when his wife, not knowing what was done, came in. And Peter answered unto her, Tell me whether you sold the land for so much? And she said, Yea, for so much. Then Peter said unto her, How is it that ye have agreed together to tempt the Spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of them that have buried thine husband, which uh, uh, thy husband are at the door, and shall carry thee out. Then fell she down straightway at his feet, and yielded up the ghost. And the young men came in, and found her dead, and carried her forth, buried her by her husband. And great fear came upon all the church. And upon all, uh, as and came upon as many as heard these things. And by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. And the rest, there is no man join himself to them, but the people magnified them. And believers were more added to the to the Lord, multitude, both men and women. The first one is pressure, pressure that God may allow to visit the church, get you out of your comfort zone. The second one is this. You may be, be facing difficulties and trials because of poor decisions that you are making in your life. Now, as a church, we may, we may face some trials for poor decisions, but I'm telling you, there are people that are facing problems in their life because they keep making poor decisions. Now, I, again, the whole time I was sitting over there, I was kind of fighting with myself about doing this message. I feel like, man, it's been right in line with all the messages, just continually over and over again. I feel like, man, I'd like to give them a break on this whole thing about how we get away from God and mess ourselves up and have to get back on track. But I just felt like, man, this is the way to go. And the idea is sometimes we have problems in our life because of our own poor decision making. There are people sometimes that are saying, man, what's God doing? And why is God doing this? And why is God doing that? And God hasn't done anything to you. You are, you, are, you are reaping the results of really bad decisions that you're making in your life. You've put yourself in all kinds of debt, and now you can barely get by. And you say, what's God doing? Well, you should have been thinking and applying some principles. Now, I'm not here to kick you while you're down, but I am saying sometimes it's not good to try to blame God and blame everybody else. Sometimes you may have to look ourselves and say, am I just making a series of bad decisions? <clears throat> Too often what people do is they end up trying to blame, listen now, they end up trying to blame a spouse for their bad decisions. They end up trying to blame their parents if they're a young person. They end up trying to blame a lot of people for the things that they've brought into their entire, they've brought entirely into their own life. And I'm just, my mind floods with people that should be here tonight 
that started making this a series of really bad decisions. And we tried telling them, hey, listen, don't go that way. You've got good counselors in your life. You've got good preachers in your life. You've got good friends in your life and say, don't go that way. Don't do that. Don't get involved in that. And they keep doing it. And they, and they, and they, I think about this thing about lying to the Holy Ghost. They're, they're doing something where they're saying, God, it, it's no big deal. It's not going to happen to me. I don't believe that it's wrong. I'll just do what I want to do. And they find themselves down the road in a complete and total mess thinking, where's God and where are the people around me that's supposed to be here? When I think about the prodigal son, I think about the fact that, that uh, he started off with this kind of statement, give me, give me, give me. I like the, the way he talked at the end when he said, make me as one of thy hired servants. He started off with saying, I want everything you got. And this is what I thought was interesting when I've read through that before. He didn't want the father and he didn't appreciate the father's house, but he wanted everything the father could give him. I want the blessing. I just don't want to be around you. Give me everything you've got, and then I'm going to take off and, and waste it on riotous living, the Bible says. And, uh, and while he had the money, you know what you have? When you've got money, you've got friends. Can I tell you what? The, the friends you've got because you've got money, when you're out of money, guess what? You're out of friends. And he found himself eventually having to eat in a hog pen the same things the hogs were eating. Now, what he could have done is like a lot of people could have said, now, where are my friends? It's my friend's fault. They spent up all my money. It's my dad's fault. He should have told me this or done that. Or where's my dad at when I'm in this mess right here? Where's mom at when I'm in this mess right here? And they could blame everybody else. I love the fact that he said, it's me. And I'm saying to you that sometimes the issues we're having in our life are because we've been making poor decisions. Making poor decisions on the people you're talking to, the people you're spending time around, the things you're looking at. Poor decisions. Young people, listen to this, young people. <clears throat> you spend time looking at the wrong things and putting the wrong type of junk in your mind and it messes up the way you see relationships. And you can't have right relationships anymore. You can't blame that on anybody else. That's you making bad decisions. You slipping off and drinking and doing stuff that you think your parents don't see. I'm going to tell you something. You can maybe hide it from mom and dad, but you're not hiding it from God. And you find yourself in an absolute mess And listen, sometimes the only times we ever get ourselves right is when everything falls apart around us. And then we finally realize, man, I really am making a mess of my life. I've got to get right. And let me tell you what most people do. Most people don't have the character that the prodigal had of coming back to the father and saying, you were right, I was wrong. You know what they do? They get mad and they run off even deeper into all the mess. Poor decisions. Poor decisions. Look at John chapter number 15. John chapter number 15. I don't know how many times I've tried to say to people, look, don't go that way. Don't go that direction. Don't do that thing. It's not going to be profitable for you. You know, the Bible talks about, you know, you have pastors and you have teachers, and you have leaders in your life. And in, I believe it's Hebrews chapter 13, it says, whose faith follow considering the end of their conversation, considering the end of where they're trying to take you. Can I tell you something? Listen, there are some people that you get advice from that you're hanging out with, that you're letting influence your life, and they are taking you in the wrong direction. And then God puts people in your life, Sunday school teachers and And helpers or people in your life or preachers that are preaching the word trying to put you on the right track. And you say, I refuse to listen to what is right. And I just want to listen to my friends. And you end up in a bad spot. You end up in a mess in your life. And you're saying, how did I get here? Well, there were probably many signs along the road. I think when you were singing a while ago, you're talking about I'm at a crossroads in my life. There were many signs along the way telling you that you need to walk with Jesus. You need to walk with the Bible, walk with the spirit, walk in the direction of people that are wise that are in your life trying to put you in the right direction and you refuse to do it, then don't be surprised if you find yourself in a complete mess in a ditch somewhere. John chapter 15, look at verse number 1. 
I am the true vine, and my Father is the husband. And every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. So here's a, here's a tree bearing fruit, but now he wants to bring forth more fruit. And so he said he has to purge it. Now that's exactly what uh, Pastor Bishop talked about the other day. Verse number three, Now are you clean through the word which I have spoken unto you? Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. Now, he's talking about bringing forth fruit, then bearing more fruit, and then much fruit. Let me tell you something. God may put you through some things because God is trying to purge some things out of your life that are hindering you. So I told you it could be pressure to get you out of your comfort zone. It could be poor decisions you're making. It could be the purging of God. Now, I preached on this already, so I won't try to exhaust it when I talked about thank God for a God that loves me enough to correct me. But God may be trying to get some things out of your life. And over and over again, you say, man, why does he preach the same thing over and over again? I promise you, I'm not sitting at home thinking about, let me line up these sermons so that I can keep hammering home a point. I promise you, that's not the way I'm doing it. I'm just studying my Bible. And as I study my Bible, things come up to my mind or somebody asks me a question and it kind of comes up. And so if you're saying, why does he keep pounding the same thing over and over again? Or why? Why are other preachers? I, I told uh, Pastor Bishop, I said, hey, it's Thanksgiving service. It's all yours on Tuesday. I figured he's going to come in and talk about, you know, ice cream and butterflies and, and all kinds of sweet things. For And he talked about the refiner's fire. I mean, that's not a Thanksgiving message. But it's the message God gave him. You say, well, why is God hounding these things over and over again? Let me say this. Maybe it's because of some things in some of our lives. Now, look, we know how to dress it up. You know how to dress it up and make it look right on the outside. Now listen real close. But the inside may be a complete mess. We know how to, we know how to make sure everybody around us, kind of like Ananias Sapphira, we know how to make sure everybody around us thinks that everything is going good. But remember again, the Holy Spirit knows exactly what's going on in our lives. And the Word of God is quick and powerful, and as it's being preached, it's piercing our hearts. And what we could be saying the whole time is, ah, I'm fine, I don't need this. And we keep going through trials of our life, and we keep thinking, why do I keep going through that? And why do I keep hearing the same sermons over and over again? And I'll tell you why. It's because God loves you enough to try to purge some things out of your life that you know you need to get out of your life. I mean, you know... Those things need to be gone. You don't have to raise your hand, and I would, I would advise you not to raise your hand. But if a little man on your heart could raise his hand and maybe wave a hanky, would he do that tonight? Would he raise his hand and say, there's something in my life right now that you have hammered over and over and over again that I am not getting right about? Okay, if that's the case, you know what you chalk it up as? Well, that preacher, he just... I would chalk it up as, I have a God that's trying to purge some things out of my life so I can be more fruitful. He's trying, and, it, and listen, nobody likes change. Nobody likes purging. Listen, if a tree could scream, it would probably scream every time you said, let me trim off a little bit here and trim off a little bit there. We don't have flowers at our house. Stacy's just not a good, Stacy's a great cook, but Stacy's not a really good gardener. All right? It's a sandwich technique. You say something nice, then something bad, then something nice again. But she's not a great, but her mom is a gardening machine. And she can grow anything and make them look beautiful. And you can find her if you go out there and it's a nice day. You can find her. Sometimes she'll be out there trimming this and trimming that and fixing this up and making this look pretty and watering this and doing that. And she does all those types of things. And I'm telling you, that flower bed looks beautiful. But I can tell you, it doesn't happen by mistake. The beautiful flowers you find in that garden are the product of somebody trimming off this and trimming off that and finding this bug and pulling it out and finding this insect and getting it out of there and getting this weed and pulling it up and spending time tilling around all those things and fixing all those things. Let me tell you something. God wants you to be beautiful and flourish and have fruit in your life, but that takes purging some things out of your life. I know. I, I, I would, if it was me, I'd be sitting out there, I'd be going, all right, what's the next point? 
But you got to get some of these things out. And if you said in your heart while ago, there's some things that I'm supposed to be getting out of my life right now, then do it. Look at Romans chapter number 13. <clears throat> Look at verse number 11, Romans 13, verse 11. And that knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than we believe. Meaning this, right now, this second, I'm nearer to the day that he takes me home than I was five minutes ago, right? And I'm nearer right now than when I started this sentence. I mean, every, every second I'm getting nearer to that day. And he says, look, we're getting closer. In verse number 12, the night is far spent. The day is at hand. So what do we do as we're getting closer to the Lord? Let us, therefore, cast off the works of darkness. Let us put on the armor of light. Let us get rid of some of the bad stuff in our life. We know it's not supposed to be there. Let, watch this. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting, at excessive feastings, drinking, or sensual indulgences, not in rioting, not in drunkenness, intoxication, not in chambering, now, chambering, think about this for a minute, immoral sexual behavior, but it's in a chamber. What do you call it? You call it a bed chamber, a bedroom. All right, so things, immoral behavior you're doing in a bedroom. Now, if you're married, that's a marriage bed's undefiled. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about you doing things, sleeping around, doing stuff you know you're not supposed to be doing. Look, the day is at hand. The night's far spent. The day's at hand. We're getting closer to the day we're with the Lord. We need putting all this garbage off and putting on the right things. He, he goes on from chamber, not in chambering and wantonness. Wanton is a lack of restraint. And a lot of these have to do with immorality. Not in strife and envying, contentions and envying what somebody else has. And then he says this, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fill the lust thereof. You know what you need to do? Some of us have got to do this, purging. You need to start right now removing things from your life that you know are a provision. They're an opportunity for me to fulfill my lust. Now the little man inside your heart was just going to amen. Now what you did was you said, shh, don't say anything. People will know I've got problems. But the little man in your heart was saying, yeah, there are some things I need to cut out of my life so that I stop making provision, fulfill the lust of my flesh. You know, it'd be crazy for a man that was a diabetic to get a job working at Dunkin' Donuts. Why? Because he's like, man, I just, I think I'm just going to get me a scoop. It's right there. Look, if you know you've got problems with some of the sins that you know you've got issues with, Get them out of your house. Make it harder to fulfill the lust thereof. Cut some things off. Pressure from God. Poor decisions. Purging. <clears throat> Sometimes it's because of it's a, per, a perverse nation that we're living in. And, and, uh, and we do know that. Look at Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9. I may just give you like two or three more and, I, and I'll be done. Acts chapter 9, and look at verse number 1. Watch this now. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired him letters to Damascus, to the synagogue, that if he be found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecuted. Watch what he says there. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. It's hard to kick against the pricks. Now, you know what that is? 
what they had was a guy would have a, a, like a, a donkey or an ox or something, and they had this long stick that had a, a jab thing on the end of it. And what they could do is they could poke him on one side and get him to move here or poke him on the other side and get him to move there, and they could make him move as they were trying to plow or do whatever they're trying to do. And what the, that ox would do a lot of times is as you'd poke him, he would kick. Now, I'm saying I would kick too if somebody poked me in the, the back end. I'd probably kick as well, but that's what he's doing. He's kicking against those pricks and saying, stop kicking me. But somebody's, listen now, the reason why they're poking him is they're trying to get his attention to get him to turn a certain direction. And he's kicking against them saying, I don't like it. And this is what my answer would be. Well, then stop going the wrong direction. Start listening and go in the right direction. Why are you sometimes getting poked a lot? And again, it's the same line of thinking we're going so far is, is this. Sometimes you're getting pricked so that you'll change. And God's trying to get you on the right track. Now, listen, if I was talking to a lost person, who I'd say to them, it may be that God's trying to wake you up to your lost condition so you can put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And it's over and over again, things are happening in your life to try to show you that you've got a need for a Savior. And there would be a lot of people we could talk to about that. But some of us, maybe we are saved, but God's trying to get our attention over and over and over again so we can make some changes in our life. Listen, instead of, getting, instead of getting mad at the Bible or at the preacher or at the Spirit, what you ought to do is say, I'm going to make a change tonight. I'm tired of the pressure. I'm tired of the pricks. I'm going to give in. Now, here's, here's what happens, though. Listen, a lot of you have tried to make some changes already at some points in your life, and you felt like, well, I made a change, and it didn't stick, and I messed up. That's, that's because you're fighting the flesh. That's because you're fighting the flesh. And the flesh will give you fits if you don't... It's not a one-time thing. It's not a, I took a pill and now I'm good and my flesh doesn't bother me anymore. It's a daily thing you've got to do to fight this flesh and walk in the Spirit. And just because you fell down, a just man falleth seven times, but he does what? He rises up again. You've got to get back up. And just because you've tried in the past and you've messed up, and you tried again and you messed up, I would say you still got to get back up. 1 Corinthians chapter number 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 16. <clears throat> Why are we seeing problems? Why are we seeing difficulties? 1 Corinthians 16. Lest you start thinking that everything is bad, let me give you a good one. 1 Corinthians 16. This is what he says. <clears throat> In verse number 8, For I will not see you now by the way, but I trust to tarry a while for you, if the Lord permit. But I will tarry at Ephesus until Pentecost, for a great door and effectual is opened unto me, and there are many adversaries. Can I tell you that sometimes you'll have pressure and difficulties, not because you're on the wrong track, but because you're on the right track. And sometimes we'll face things as a church simply because we're on the right track, trying to do the right things for God. And let me tell you, we've been trying to do as much as we can for the Lord. You, just gotta, you better just get it in your mind that if you're part of a church that's going to try to go out and do something, that there's going to be something trying to rise up to stop you and get you unmotivated to go out and tell people. Well, we've, we've tried to do things. We did the Operation Christmas Child and sent out 400 and something boxes with John and Romans and gospel and trying to get that into kids in foreign countries. Uh, before that, we think we sent out 10,000 tracks. We figured out there's 12,000 homes, uh, residences in Copper's Cove. So we sent out 10,000 uh, flyers to every home with the gospel on it with QR codes that they could watch. We put a video together of how to get saved and put all that together so they could watch it and have a clear presentation of the gospel. Uh, we went for the out to the uh, fall festival. We put out some 3,000 tracks and put them in, in bags. Uh, Pastor Miller did most of that work, but put candy in bags and then put gospel tracks in those bags and sealed them up and sent them out. You know what we got as a result of that? We got a like a one-star review for for the church. And the person that gave us a one-star review says that they were upset that we put gave candy to their kids along with a gospel track that told them about Jesus Christ. You say, well, that just sounds absolutely bizarre. But that's the way this world thinks. 
And if you're going to try to do it, now listen, that's not, very that, that's not really that big, but I'm going to tell you, the more we try to get out there with the gospel, the more we try to give the gospel to people, the more that the devil is going to try to rise up and cause us problems and bring more adversity against us. You better, just, you better just get your mind wrapped around that the more doors of opportunity, I'm telling you, doors of opportunity have been opening up to us. We've been going on the post and, and, uh, and having a, a, a Bible study classes on Wednesdays at the, on the post. Brother James and them have been able to do stuff with wounded spirits here, but also wounded spirits on post. And, uh, and then they've had uh, one of the female chaplains came up and said, we've got a, a lot of females that would not want to talk to a male. Can your wife be part of this and speak to a lot of the females that are going through trauma? And so now they're trying to get it worked out to where she can spend more time with these people. I'm telling you, their doors are opening up all over the place. And they said, you're doing such a good job of this. When you go to the warrior transition unit and just be there and give classes on people that are getting out, there are opportunities opening up for our church all over the place to do more and more and more. We've had to bust out what used to be a, a cry room is now part of the nursery. We've had to bust the nursery in different directions because we're overflowing in the nursery and we're trying to figure out what to do about a parking lot. And you got to get permits for even moving a pile of dirt from one place to another. And we got to get that paved and we've got to do more rooms and figure out more classroom space and do more things. We've got ideas for for schools and all kinds of stuff, but we're just kind of out of space. That's a good problem to have, but I'm telling you, the more opportunities that God gives us to try to be a blessing to more people in this community and around the world, I promise you there'll be more adversity. And adversity is not there for you to stop. Adversity, in those cases, tell you you're on the right track. <clears throat> Let me give you the last one. Look at 1 Kings chapter number 17. I'll say this, and I, and I want you to take this <clears throat> the way it's intended. I don't, I don't mean this as a plug for, for me. I don't mean it for that. I mean, I mean this on Tuesdays, we pray for our leadership of our church. We pray for individuals, pray for all of you, we pray for a lot of you. We pray for the leadership of our church. And I can tell you this, that a principle from the Bible is you smite the shepherd and the sheep will flee. And so as we try to do more to try to reach pe more people, in this community, I would ask you, please pray for the leadership of our church. Pray for their families. Um, pray, for, for, pray for their spirit. Pray that they would stay on the right track. I, I know me, and I think I know the leaders we've got here. We've got great, I feel like we have great leaders in this church trying to minister to people. Whether that's a, that's a deacon, whether that's a Sunday school teacher, whether that's all the, the pastor staff and the, and the children workers and all those things, we have them. But I can tell you this. We are not above Satan trying to find a way to cause problems in our homes, in our families, in our church. We've got, we have got to stay prayed up. And the more our church begins to start trying to do more, the more opportunities for Satan to try to find a way to cause problems. So we've got to stay prayed up. 1 Kings chapter 17. Last one I'll show you tonight is this one. 1 Kings 17, in verse 1. And Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Get thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook Cherith, that is before Jordan. And it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook, and I have, and I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. Now, I've... I've preached through this several times in this little section of Scripture many, many times. He said, I've, I've, prepared, I've prepared the provision that you need in a specific place. Now, remember, he has been preaching that there's going to be a drought, there's no water, and that means there's going to be no food, there's going to be no water. And he's going to suffer the same way a lot of these people are going to suffer that are, that are having the results of this drought. And it says in verse number 5, so he went and did according to the word of the Lord. Now, that's important. I've got that underlined and I've got it circled in my Bible. He did according unto the word of the Lord. For he went and dwelt by the brook Cherith, that is, before Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning, and bread and flesh in the evening. And he drank of the brook. And it came to pass after a while. Now, you know what it doesn't tell you? It doesn't tell you how long. 
It didn't say, hey, Elijah, go stay by the brook. You're going to be there for one month. At the end of that one month. And, and this is the deal. If you knew it's going to be one month, you could say, well, I can, I can do anything for a month. I mean, I can do it. But he, he didn't get told how long it's going to take before things started working out a little better. You know what all he could do? Listen now. As I'm almost done, this is, all, all he could do was he could wait for ravens on their time schedule. It wasn't like, hey, I'm getting a little bit hungry, then I go to the refrigerator. He had to wait for them on their time schedule to show up with something and drop it on him. And then when he got thirsty, listen, you know what happens in a drought to the brooks? They begin to start drying up. You know what you got after a little while? You don't have a stream anymore. Now you've just got some standing water and you're, you're sucking some water out of what's turning into a mud puddle. And you might be thinking, well, how long am I going to stay here? And what is all this for? And I've thought about this before. I've had conversations with leaders in different churches before about this same thing and saying, listen, this is, it rolls off the tongue so well to just trust God and trust God's word, but it's different to say it than it is to live it. Today, somebody was texting me and they're going through a difficult time in a church and, and they don't have a lot of finances and they're really struggling. And, um, and it's, a, it's a real difficult, it's a real hardship. And, uh, and I wrote down some advice um, for the guy, and I made this statement. I said, this is way easier said than it is lived. I can give you advice all day long. I'm not you having to live it. It's easy to tell somebody how to do something, but I'm not where you're at trying to suck water out of a mud puddle right now, hoping a raven drops something in on me. But, but here's the thing that's interesting. He's there doing this in verse number 8. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there, because I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. Now, let me tell you, this is a chapter I just finished writing in that book that will be out someday. And one of the chapters I wrote was the school of humility. And God will put you through some things to really cause you to depend on Him. Now listen to the reason why. So that whenever you have to speak to people about depending on the Lord, it's not just, it doesn't come out like somebody that read it in a book somewhere, but it comes out like somebody that believes what they're saying. Because what He's going to do, if it had been me, it would have been like, wait a minute, I've been drinking from a brook and I'm getting fed from a fountain and now you're sending me to a widow woman's house and like she's going to have more. But he was given the word of the Lord. Listen, in, in verse number, in, in verse number um, 2, the word of the Lord came unto him. And in verse number 5, he went, unto, he went according to the word of the Lord. In verse number 8, the word of the Lord came unto him. And in verse number 10, and he arose and went. And it says to Zarephath, and when he came to the gate of the city, behold, the widow woman was there gathering of sticks, and, she, and he called to her and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water and a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to fetch it, he called to her and said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thine hand. Now, if she had been like women of America, they would have been like, What in the world's wrong with you? And she said, As the Lord liveth, as the Lord God liveth, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal and a barrel, and a little oil and a cruise. And behold, I gather, I'm gathering two sticks, that I may go in and dress it for me and my son, that we may eat it and die. And Elijah said unto her, Fear not, go and do as thou hast said, but make me thereof a little cake first. Now, if she didn't, she's already stressed out, and now he's saying, Go oh, get me a little bit of water. If that didn't do it, this would have done it. Make me a little bit of something first and bring it unto me and after make for thee and for thy son. And this is what he said. And this is the only thing I'm going to read to you in verse 14. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel. You know what he's going to tell her? Don't worry. The provisions are going to be there for you. Now, let me tell you, how could he speak with such authority? You know how he could tell them? You can tr Listen, you know how he could tr say with authority, you can trust the word of the Lord. You know how you can say it? Because he had to learn to trust the word of the Lord. Why do some things happen in our life? Now, I'm going to say this, the last one is this, preparation for you to serve better. Preparation for you to serve better. Romans 5, 3 says this, and not only so, but we glory in tribulations. 
You say, man, that just always sounded crazy to me. Glory and tribulations? Yep, we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. And patience, experience. And experience hope. You know what it means? It says this, as I go through trouble, I learn how to patiently wait on God, and then I gain experience of how God works. And then on the back side of that, I gain hope. You know what? It's good for me to have hope so I can give you hope. 2 Corinthians 1.4, I don't sign Bibles that often, but if I ever sign a Bible or ever sign a card, most of the time I'll write 2 Corinthians 1.4 at the bottom under my name. And that's the verse that, it wasn't my, the verse I lived by, but it's the verse that became the verse I lived by after we went through some trouble. And here's the verse, 2 Corinthians 1.4. He says, Who comforted us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. God can take the things you're going through in your life and help you use those things to better help somebody else. There's a, a poem, and I've quoted it. I've quoted it. In fact, before Brother Freddie sent me a text today and said, I'm not feeling well, I was driving here quoting this, this, um, this poem, seeing if I could do it without reading it, because I, I love this poem. And, uh, and I couldn't, so I'm going to read it to you. It says this, I'd rather see a sermon than hear one any day. I'd rather one should walk... Uh, uh, that should walk with me than merely show and tell the way. The eye is a better pupil and more willing than the ear. Fine counsel is confusing, but examples always clear. And the best of all preachers are the men who live their creed. For to see the good put in action is what everybody needs. I soon could learn to do it if you'll let me see it done. I could watch your hands in action, but your tongue too fast may run. And the lecture you deliver may be very wise and true, but I'd rather get my lessons by observing what you do. For I might misunderstand you in the high advice you give, but there's no misunderstanding how you act and how you live. When I wrote, when I wrote that chapter in that, in that book, I was not planned to write it, but as I was thinking through the school of humility that leaders will have to go through in order to minister to people better, I, I wrote this down, I, and this is the truth. When I came out of uh, Bible school, I had the Bible school uh, diploma. I had an ordination papers that said I was ordained. Um, I had somebody that blessed off of me and said, go do what you're going to do. And I had a church that said, come and be the associate pastor. And, uh, and my mind was, you tell people what the Bible says. I mean, you get up and you tell them what the Bible says. And, the, and, and, uh, and there was a lot of people that liked my youth and my zeal. They liked that, man, that guy's got youth, that guy's got zeal. And a lot of people liked it, and there's a lot of people didn't like it because all I came across is kind of an arrogant person that was telling you what to do with no feeling, no heart at all. But I thought that's what we're preaching is. You just tell people what to do, and, and the people that like it probably are the spiritual people. The people that don't like you are probably the carnal people that need to go anyway. And so that's just kind of my mindset of how I thought this thing works, and that's what you've got to do until I felt like God put me through the school of humility. You say, well, you need to go back to school. I probably do at some point. But I had to go through some humbling situations that at the time, listen now, at the time of drinking from the brook, I wasn't too happy about it. But on the other side of it, looking back, I say, I'm thankful that God put me through some things that helped me to see people better, to see His Word better, to see God better. And there's people sitting in this room right now that I, 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 could, I could call you out right now and you would be happy, for, you'd be okay with me calling you out. And you would agree with me and you would say, you're right, preacher. And there are things that on this side, you thought things, you said things, you had a view of God, a view of the Word, a view of church, a view of stuff. And this is the way you thought and you would say it, no problem. And then you went through some difficulties and you're probably still in some of them. And on the other side of it coming out, you're seeing at a whole different level. Amen? You're seeing God at a different level. The things you knew in theory before, now you know. The verses that used to, hey, look, I, I, wrote, I wrote down in, uh, in that book, there were people that I thought were mature Christians that said 
some really immature things. We, we were trying to have children. We were struggling with that whole thing. We had a guy that used to come to this church years ago before any of you came to this church. Well, not all of you, but most of you. And he said to, us, said to us one time, he says, well, are you sure maybe you're just not giving enough money to God? If you gave more money to God, God would probably give you a baby. Now, let me tell you, that was supposed to be an, a mature Christian, but that's one of the most immature things I've ever heard anybody say in my life. There's a lot of people that have theories about how God works before they have to go through things. And when they go through things, they end up on this side. You know what? They, they, they don't just think they know about God. Now they know about God. And now they're knowing things at a different level. Now they're, they're seeing God different than they saw God before. They're seeing people different than they saw people before. They're seeing the truths of the Word of God, not just as truths you throw out there, but if lifelines you hold on to when you're sinking in some things. They see things different. So the, the sermon is, why are difficulties coming in life? Well, sometimes it's just shaking you up a little bit so that you can get out of your comfort zone. Sometimes it's because you are making repeated horrible decisions and you keep falling in the same deal. Have you ever seen that little video of the sheep that's in that little ditch? It's a little ditch that's been carved out. The sheep's in that ditch and somebody gets the sheep out. There's guys that are trying to pull the sheep out and they get him, finally get him up and everybody applauds. They get him up. They send him on the ground and he takes like three steps, jumps in the air, right back in the exact same ditch and he's stuck again. I think about Christians and I think there are Christians I know that I could put their name on that sheep or on the side of it and I'd be like, that's them. You get them out, they take a jump, they're right back in it again. Sometimes it's because of our own stuff. Sometimes it is because we're on the right track and God's just trying to, trying to keep us going on the right track and the devil's trying to stop us. And sometimes it's because we're supposed to learn something so we can help somebody else. And I'm just telling you, you say, well, I've got some bad things happen in my life. I wouldn't say that God's the author of the bad things that happen in your life, but I can say this. God is able to take all things and work them together for a good, according to His purpose, and use you to be a help to other people. And um, I wrote, when, I wrote that, when I wrote that chapter in the book the other day, I've said this, most of you know this, but for 20 years we're we were trying to have children I would, on this side of it, I would not change one, one piece of that journey. Wouldn't change one piece now that we've got Gabriella. Now, in the journey, I despised every, every week of that journey, my wife more. On this side of the journey, <clears throat> I am thankful for every bit of it. I'm thankful for the time that we got to spend as a husband and wife living together with not having children and just getting to do things together and becoming best friends. I'm thankful. At the time, I wasn't as thankful. I didn't see it. And now I pray for several people in our church. I don't know why God's brought them here. People in our church that are struggling with some of those things. And I, and I, I, I don't know, but I can tell you this. I can tell you when you're thinking, I don't have anybody I can go to that can understand what I'm going through. I promise you there's some people that can understand what you're going through when it comes to that. And I've had people tell me before, I'm thankful that you're here and that you can tell us how God comforted you through it. And I'm anxious to hear how you can comfort. My only prayer is, God, please don't make me wait as long as they had to wait. I say, well, believe me, I'm praying the same way you're praying for you. But I am telling you that there's some things you're going through in your life and God can use what you're going through to be a help to somebody else if you'll let God do it. So why am I going through some of the things? Well, what you need to do tonight is look at your life and see where do I fit in these four or five or six things. Where am I at in those things? Hey, listen, even if you've been making repeated mistakes, you know, what, you know what David did? David wrote a psalm, Psalm 51, to help other people not fall in the same traps that he fell into and the mistakes he made. You know what you can even do with your mistakes? You can say, listen, at least I've got a God that accepts me back and has worked in my life, and I can tell other people, don't fall in the same trap I fell into. <clears throat> so where do you fit in this sermon tonight, and how can you make some adjustments to your life? Let's stand to our feet. I told somebody today in text, I said, I know you're going through a difficult time. And this is, an, this is something you need to all hear this. You're going through a difficult time. I said, while you're going through a difficult time and you don't have a lot of light, don't make a big decision. Don't make a big decision. 
It's not the time to quit. It's the time to see what God's doing. Don't make a big decision. And I know it's hard to hear that, but you're going through something, and watch this now, and other people are watching how you handle it. And what you're going through, like Daniel, like the, the three young men in the, in the fiery furnace, that really, that trial was more for Nebuchadnezzar than it was for them. People are watching how you're dealing with the trial you're going through. Don't make a big decision and quit on God in the midst of a trial. It may be on the other side of it, you learn a valuable lesson and you're better off for the trial than you were before you ever went through the trial. Lord, bless these people tonight. Do a work in their heart. Bless them now. Help them in Jesus' name. Amen. Some already praying. Why don't you come pray tonight?